Thank you. I'd like to start this off with a thank you to our, our elders. Wow, that, that took me a little bit. Thank you to our elders and Derek. Uh, I think it's very kind of them to allow a 13-year-old to come up here and preach to all of you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just kidding. I turn 13 next week. <laughs> Good morning, church. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I'd like to give you a little bit of an introduction to myself. I am Dalton Evans. I am 17 years old. Uh, I am wrapping up my junior year in high school. Um, I grew up in church, but it's really become real these past couple of years here at uh, Point Church Holly Springs and now Lake Springs Church, and I'm very grateful for that. God has showed me a lot through uh, some wonderful mentors like Derek Kuhn, uh, Daniel Fairchild, the Watts, and Garrett Huxford. I love to thank them for uh, all that they've done through me, their mentorship. It, it, they have really blessed me in a way that I cannot express in words right now. Um, but above all else, I'd like to thank my parents. They've been with me throughout my faith journey, uh, going from church to church uh, when we moved here. But... These past couple of weeks when I've been preparing this, they've been absolutely wonderful. So let's all embarrass them with a round of applause. <laughs> That's her. <laughs> um, if you would open your Bibles today to Matthew 6, this chapter is from Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. And there's a lot of great stuff to talk about in Matthew 6 and this sermon. Uh, but today we're going to be taking a look at verse 33. Uh, this verse is one of my favorites. It, I believe it has some of the most depth and significance and application to our lives. So let's, let's read this. Verse 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. There's something going on. All right. So we're going to be looking at this verse in a few sections because there's a lot to go over. Seek first. What does that mean? His kingdom. What in the world does that mean? His righteousness, these things, what is Jesus talking about here? Uh, so we're going to dissect this. But to do that, we need to look at the context. Because when you have a verse that has, that's very loaded and has a lot of parts to it and references, then we need to look at the context. So we're going to backtrack a little bit to verse 25. Verse 25 says, same chapter. It starts with saying, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one hour to his life? Verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All right. So to start off looking at this context, we're going to look at verse 25 first. He says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So Jesus is talking about three things that we tend to worry about, three basic necessities, that being food, drink, and clothing. Already Jesus is starting off at the level of pretty much impossible because that's the kind of person that Jesus is. It seems difficult as a human being not to worry about things. It's more of a part of life. Like, we've all worried. We're all human. We all do these things. And I mean, yeah, worrying is a fairly negative thing, but everybody does it. We can't really avoid it, can we? But, Jesus continues in verse 26, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So, Jesus just talks about birds here, and he recognizes that they don't really do much for the kingdom. They're just his creation. And he still feeds them. They don't do anything for him, but he feeds them. And then he says, we're more valuable than them. Us as humans are more valuable than birds. So what Jesus is saying here is that God is a loving father who will, of course, provide for the needs of his children. 
And so there's no need to worry about these things. And then he continues in verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now, there's a quote I'd like to reference here from a pastor named Charles Spurgeon. He was a preacher in a pretty large Baptist church back in the 19th century in the middle of London. And he says, if therefore God will do it, why should you worry about it? If you saw a farmer feeding his barn door fowls plentifully, you would not believe a slander who said that the man starved his children. And as long as you see God providing for the lower creatures, and even the wild beasts that he has formed, Rest you assured that he will take care of his children. Therefore, is fretful care unnecessary? He's telling us not to be so spiritually blind that our main concerns are things that perish instead of things that last forever. That, I believe, is the main focus of what Jesus is trying to say here. Continuing on, verse 31 says, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Now, Jesus is speaking to his Jewish audience here, and for him to mention the Gentiles is for him to say, even those outside of God's chosen people worry about these things. It's not a worry of us. It's a worry of the world, and we're not to be like the world. He's saying that we as Christians should be a people that don't worry about our basic needs because he's going to provide for us. How incredible would we look to the world if we as a church were solely focused on Christ, that no trial, no setback, no shortcoming can jar us from him, and that we would never worry about anything, and we would be dependent on him. Our calling, then, is to seek God's kingdom, to honor Christ, and to serve the Lord. I'd also like to point out that these three things that Jesus talks about are necessary for survival. Uh, Sometimes we'll look at these verses and go, God will make everything better for me, so, you know, I shouldn't worry, right? I should just trust God and everything will be great. But that is not at all what it says. And that logic, when it fails, leads people to doubt God and to question whether or not he's truly good. And it's really easy to apply that thinking to something incredibly easy to worry about, like finances. It's not God will make everything or my finances better. It's actually much better than that. Jesus is saying, stop worrying about the finances. It's all about me trusting in God with my whole heart. Not prioritizing the finances, not prioritizing the food, not prioritizing the mundane things that everyone else is worried about. So that it liberates me from worrying about it. I do want to offer this up, though. A situation where it's really hard not to worry about the money. Several years ago, my family kind of got hit with the realization that we did not have our money under control. We were renting a house in the Bay Area of California, and my dad had just got laid off the day before we were about to go on an expensive vacation. So everyone was pretty worried right there. (laughs) Except me, I was 10 and I was having a blast. (laughs) (laughs) But my parents were very worried about the money in that situation, especially on that trip. That was not a fun trip for them. But they knew to say, they they were worried about it because they're human. But they said, God, we know to trust in you. Deep down in their heart, they said, we're not going to stress about these things because it's all in your hands. And now the financial situation was a problem, and I don't think God would tell us to dismiss a problem like that because that leads to a lot more problems. So my parents got together, and they started finding biblically-based resources to get us out of that dark moment. We start, uh, my dad found another job. We started sacrificing the joys of eating out. And for a Californian who loves In-N-Out, that was not easy. And we started, to, and they started to fight back against what the money was attacking us with. And in just under a year of starting that journey, we had come out of it with thousands of dollars in debt paid off. But my parents, bless their hearts, were focused on God the entire way through. Because they knew that if they worried about that situation, if they worried about the finances more than they were going to trust in God then that problem never would have gone away in the fear that it did in the face of God. The point is to stop prioritizing our finances. And that doesn't mean we don't have to work. We're going to go to the other extreme here. It does not give us permission to be lazy, to be like, you know, I I feel like I'm hearing a word from the Lord to quit my job and stop worrying about my finances. (laughs) Which, again, not what it says. 
2 Thessalonians 3.10 clarifies this, by the way. Paul says, if a man does not work, he does not eat. Which makes my dad very happy for me to admit this. <laughs> so I can't go around thinking that God's going to provide everything for me without a little bit of effort from myself. My priority has to be seeking God's kingdom. And in seeking first God's kingdom, it means that I have to be a faithful employee. It means I'm going to be a hard worker. I'm not just going to focus on the, mo on the money issues. That's all secondary. But I'm going to focus on God. Because the primary issue is serving the Lord, honoring Christ, and seeking first the kingdom. Now, the ancient world, unlike most of our uh, lives today in the West, it's focused on this concept of daily bread. They were literally getting paid every day so that they could eat that night. And some were getting paid in the food that they were going to bring home that night. And lots of people still experience this. And that's why in the Lord's Prayer, there's this verse, give us today our daily bread. Jesus was leading them in a prayer for God to provide for their needs. So we still work. We still work hard. We still labor. But we work hard for the Lord. Because if we're going to intentionally not do that, we're not going to be provided for by the Lord because we're not putting him first. We're out of his reach at that point. If a man refuses to work, he does not eat. And even those that cannot work, maybe because of disability or they've been in prison for however long, I believe would have even more faith to trust in God to provide for them. They have the disadvantage in a society like ours. The world is against them fulfilling God's design. Their flesh is against them fulfilling God's design. But Jesus says even faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains. Faith for God to provide in the lowest of circumstances is faith that the Western world has never really seen before. And that faith you can look at and say, that's a holy person right there. So now, we have finally made it to verse 33. Seeking first the kingdom of God. Now to seek something first is to actively go after it as if it's the most important thing in your life. More important than food, clothing, work, and we'll see Jesus talk about those things. Oh, we just did. I had to reorder this a couple of times. <laughs> Um, and so we actively want to seek God's kingdom first. So let me give you an example. Let's say perhaps you're towards the end of high school and you feel called to go to a private college to major in ministry. <laughs> Some folks know what I'm talking about. What, uh, the biggest thing about that is I need to fund that because that is very expensive. Now the question is, what lengths would you go to to make sure that you can afford to do what God's calling you to do. My dad will say, find a job. Now, if you're like me, feeling the desire to get a job doesn't come too quickly, especially at this age. But soon you look at those tuition costs and you're like, gracious, my dad was right. I need a job. And that isn't really, I need to find a job I like. If I'm desperate enough, I'm going to say, I will find a job. I will clean, I will sweep, I will Uber, I will do whatever I need to do to make sure that I can provide for this need. And that's all because of the sense of desperation, a need to fulfill God's calling for my life. I will say, if you feel like your life isn't doing enough for the Lord, get that sense of desperation to say, Lord, I'm going to seek you first. I'm going to put you first in everything, and I will go to whatever length that you need me to go to in order that I can fulfill your plan for my life. Whether that be in church or not, you're living your life to serve the Lord. But I encourage you to find some desperation for it, because God is eager to use those that are eager to serve. And that doesn't have to be in ministry, like my example. But let's pretend for a moment that you've decided to serve the Lord, and you're presented to, with the opportunity to help out in some area of the church. Now, however you feel about that, whether you're like, yes, I will serve in that ministry, that is my calling, I need to do that. Or whether you're like, eh. Maybe that, maybe that area is not really for me. Maybe there's something else that fits my giftings a little bit better. What if you take that opportunity? Say yes. Because I think until your plate is full of serving the Lord, we should just take whatever option that we can get. Just like until I have a job that I want, I'll just take any job. And now that I have a job... I can keep my eyes open for a better job that maybe fits me a little bit better, has better pay, whatever the situation may be. 
And likewise with ministry, I just want to be able to serve the Lord in any way that I can. And then when that opportunity comes along that maybe is more for me, I can go and do that with a heart that's prepared to serve. But I got to do something for the Lord. Maybe for parents that's at home when you're ministering to your kids, or maybe it's at work when you're serving and ministering to your colleagues. Or maybe it's with family, trying to teach them the gospel. Whatever it may be, I've got to do something for the Lord, because that's my purpose, and so I'm going to get that desperation to serve. This would be much easier if we were just Jesus' disciples, wouldn't it? Opportunities to serve left and right. But it's a bit different for us compared to the disciples. We are in the industrialized age, the modern age. We have first world problems. We get annoying 15-second ads on our phones. These are the things that we're focused on and worried about. The things the disciples were focused on, like daily bread, water, shelter, what's going to sustain me today, we're more focused on our hobbies, right? What's going to entertain me on my screen today? What's going to serve me when I take a seat or when I go somewhere? But I think what the freedom from worrying about necessity should make us think about that because I don't have this fear about my daily bread, I should feel more liberated to serve the Lord, but instead I'm more liberated to seek my own constant entertainment. And that's a real danger here where we are, and it's so easy to fall into, and it's incredibly celebrated. And I am definitely speaking for myself too. The amount of time that I've spent playing video games and watching shows, and this isn't to guilt trip or to judge anybody at all, because here I am. (laughs) But you know, I could have just spent more time serving the Lord. The amount of opportunities that I've had over the years, I could have just spent more time. I wonder what I would look like as a 17-year-old Christian now had I been serving the Lord in half the time that I'd been playing video games. I wonder what I would look like if I spent 10% of the time that I spent playing video games serving the Lord. Even 5%. Because that's a lot of time, guys. (laughs) So here's, here's what I, I'd say. If we have a light switch at home that works and indoor plumbing, we're the rich. Most ancient kings would probably sell their firstborn children to have our indoor plumbing. And I hope they wouldn't. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get the point. But if we in this age are the rich and the prosperous, then another teaching of Jesus applies to us here. In Mark 4, Jesus talks about a sower sowing seeds in different soils. Say that five times fast. And one of them gets choked out by thorns or by riches. Jesus says, They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Dirk will dive a little bit into this parable, well, not a little bit, a lot into this parable next week. But I feel like we as a Western Christian society, we fall victim to this sort of materialistic, entertainment-focused ideology. And it's become so easy for me to sit back and to spend hours in front of the TV, binge-watching whatever new show just came out. It's become personal to the point where I can just pull something out of my pocket and spend hours looking at seconds of content. And I'm scared to go into my settings to see what my screen time is. We're the prosperous. We get together and do our little activities. And not that those things are necessarily wrong. But we can still seek the kingdom in those places. We can still serve the Lord if that is our first priority. And I know it's true for me. I don't know about you. But sometimes when I'm doing one of my hobbies or I'm spending time on my phone, there's this little nagging at the back of my brain that's saying, hey, maybe you're spending a little too much time doing this. Maybe you're spending too much time prioritizing this instead of prioritizing God. And I feel like if you get that, If it's saying that maybe you're spending too much time on something else, I think it's right. That's the Holy Spirit radar going off that, hey, you need to be seeking first the kingdom. And seeking first the kingdom of God, Jesus has to tell the disciples, don't worry about your daily bread. And he has to say to us, the rich, don't worry about binge watching that show as much as you do. Don't worry about seeking so much entertainment because it sucks the life away. Isn't my life more than entertainment? Is my life more than me having a good time with that thing? Don't I have far more purpose than to sit in front of the television seeking the next thing I will be entertained by and will laugh at? 
What holy people would we be? What lights to the world would we be if we truly seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now the phrase kingdom of God, I've been saying this whole time, but we haven't looked at it yet. We see repeated all throughout the New Testament, and Jesus loves to talk about it. It's like his favorite thing. We see it referred to as the kingdom of heaven at times. Um, I like to talk about uh, this pastor uh, when I was studying for this. He was talking about his Bible school study uh, that, about this particular topic. And he had been assigned to figure out two things. One, what does the kingdom of God mean? And two, what's the difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven? Because we see both of those all the time. And I found, I found it's kind of hard to really give a definition for what Jesus means by this because he uses it in different, seemingly contradicting ways. He says in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world, otherwise my servants would be fighting. So Jesus says the kingdom of God is not of this world. Okay, got it. He also says it's coming. All right, cool. Kingdom of God is among us. Oh, it's here now. It has come upon us, and it's inside of us. All at the same time. So what does Jesus really mean by this? What does the kingdom of God really mean? And this pastor came to two conclusions. And I say that like it's going to be pretty profound. It's not, but it's necessary. <laughs> the first being that the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are pretty much the same. They're interchangeable. But the second conclusion was the definition. That the simplest way that we can define it is wherever God reigns as king. Wherever God reigns as king. So what that means is that the kingdom of God is inside of us, inside of individual lives. It is not of this world, as in the world has not submitted to Christ. But the kingdom of God is among us. I am a citizen of the kingdom of God who is working in me. And we as his church, he is reigning among us and working with us. And the kingdom of God is different from the kingdoms of this world. Jesus talks about how the kingdom of God is focused on eternal things rather than worldly things. And in fact, he touches uh, on this eternal versus worldly aspect in verse 19, uh, same chapter. He says... Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now these treasures on earth that he's talking about, they're given this temporary nature. Moths and vermin destroy clothes, food, and other things. And then thieves break in and steal valuables. All of these things that we need and that we desire, all these tangible things, they're all temporary, and they will not always be ours and will likely be destroyed. None of them last forever. But he says we should store up our treasures in heaven, which are given this eternal nature. They're not destroyed or stolen. All of these small things that we can do in his name, if you give a glass of cold water in his name, for instance, because I need one right now, <laughs> just a small fleeting moment of giving, that reward, he says, is everlasting. Jesus says that our hearts put value on the wrong things. We find value in a large net worth. We find value in a PlayStation 5. We find value in luxury. But Jesus is telling us that these things our hearts should not find value in. But we should find value in Christ and opportunities to serve. Ooh, excuse me. Because that's what has value in God's eyes. Now, going back to verse 33, the last part of this, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, how do we seek God's righteousness? I'd say the first way is to study the Bible, study the scriptures. The Bible is the written word of God, and there is an infinite amount of wisdom it can and will provide to you if you go to the lengths to study it. Statistically speaking, not many Christians in this part of the world sit down for 10 minutes just to read God's word every night and pray on it. But if we are truly seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, why should we spend hours upon hours giving into the temptation of easy entertainment when we could be spending time with our loving creator and knowing what he says? You know the phrase, you get out what you put in? If I eat 10 cheeseburgers in two days, that's exactly what I'm going to get out of it. <laughs> if I spend four hours a day watching Netflix, that's exactly what I'm going to get out of it. But if I spend four hours reading, studying, and praying the Bible... I'm going to have four more hours of a relationship with God than I would having spent four hours watching Netflix. It's not easy, and it certainly is wild to the world, 
that anyone nowadays would spend such an amount of time reading the Bible by themselves. And I struggle with this too. But I urge everyone to be someone who puts godly wisdom into their mind and then goes and lives that out. This, I believe, is how we as a church should be. And if you think you'll struggle with reading the Bible along the way, you're right. I still do. It amazes me when I can get past 10 minutes. But I'm getting better. <laughs> Just want to make, make that clear. <laughs> but if you think you'll struggle with reading the Bible along the way, you're absolutely right. But there are so many people in this congregation right now, and me, that you can talk to and would be more than willing to sacrifice their time to help keep you accountable and to help you study. Another statistic said that for folks that go to church, especially on this side of the world, is that they call themselves Christian. They go to church maybe every Christmas, maybe every Easter, maybe every week, but then don't pick up the Bible until the next time that they go. And the consequence of doing that is that you don't know what the Bible says. The consequence for not knowing what the Bible says is that you start falling into the traps of the world. What I've discovered about being a Christian and not knowing what the Bible says is like trying to walk through a booby-trapped hallway without a guide or without a map. You guys know that scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? It's toward the end of the movie when Indy is going to get the Holy Grail, but there's like all of these booby traps. One tile you step on and it falls and you fall through it. The other one, solid. It's kind of like that. You don't know what idea is truly righteous. And before you know it, you're going to start believing in something that is the exact opposite of what God says is right. You're going to fall into Satan's traps if you don't know what the Bible says. Jesus is a great example of knowing what the Bible says. When he was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, he responded with scripture to every temptation. He knew the word of God because he had studied and it was written on his heart. He resisted temptation with scripture. What do we respond with if we're tempted? If we don't have scripture? How much harder is it going to be to resist that temptation if we don't have something to fight back against it with? So we have access to almost everything now. Everything that we can think about can be found somewhere on the internet. And most of the time, that is terrifying. But the cool thing about the internet is that it's a wonderful place to study. There are thousands, probably millions of resources that can help you with studying the scriptures. So let's go and study and seek his righteousness so that when we're tempted and when we face challenges, we know what to do and we know who to look to. Now, the second way we can seek God's righteousness is through prayer. Looking at Jesus again, he's the best example. When Jesus is in between miracles and traveling and preaching, he always returns to the secret place to pray. This is the thing that Jesus does the most. He finds a quiet place, probably somewhere in the wilderness, and he goes and he prays. And I cannot stress enough how much impact I've seen from God through what I have prayed for. Miracles still happen because of the power of prayer. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just as we are faithful to God, God is even more faithful to us. Anything that you can be anxious about, God can handle. God is bigger than fear. God is bigger than death. God is bigger than anxiety. God is bigger than depression. God is bigger than whatever issue plagues you and that you feel that you have no hope for. None of it can deter him from his perfect plan for us. And none of it can harm you if you have everlasting life in him. So pray. And if you need help, because all of us do, those very same people can help you. Prayer, Jesus teaches, is a righteous practice. Lastly, I want to talk about this idea of seeking his righteousness through serving the Lord. Something Paul does in 1 Timothy 3 is that he talks about these requirements for church leadership, specifically uh, in the first bit, bishops, or elders, or overseers. They're completely synonymous. And he says that those who desire that leadership desire a good work. Good for them. They're on the right track. And then he lists off all the character traits of the folks in that position. And then you can look at this for yourself. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, he lists all of those character traits a man should aspire to. And then the last one he ends with, 
able to teach. Because it's not the most important thing there. The most important trait that we can have is a heart that's willing to serve the Lord. Now, I talked a lot today about serving in ministry and that those who are eager to serve should serve. But ministry might not be for everyone, and it certainly doesn't take up everyone's time all the time. But I believe that we can make our lives our ministry. To model our life after Christ at church, yes, but also at home, at work, at school. Serving everyone just as Christ did. There are lost souls everywhere. Souls that are left in darkness because they've been despising the light all their life. I'm surrounded by it every day. Surrounded by souls that are lost and deep down are crying out for a savior. And there's no better service to the Lord than for people to be able to look at you and say, that, if that person is modeling after Christ, I want to know what the real thing is like. At the end of the day, as I mentioned before, we should be people that are desperate to serve. We should be people that are desperate to serve in any way that we can. Right? Shouldn't we? Why aren't we? Why aren't we doing that? This is exactly what Jesus is calling us to, right? And so maybe you're new to the faith and want to be able to serve, or maybe you've been here a while and never gotten around to it. Whatever the situation may be, I want to call you to seek the kingdom. I encourage you to find a place to serve in humility. And you don't have to find the exact right place you feel called to serve in right now. Not the first thing. But try not to let that be an excuse for yourself. Don't have this high bar for serving the Lord because I know it has to be the Lord before I serve in ministry. But you don't need to know it's the Lord to binge watch whatever show you're watching. I don't need to know it's the Lord to go to paint the church night because we're called to serve. I'm not necessarily calling anyone to this, and it astounds me too, but people leave jobs that they like to serve the Lord to serve the Lord more. And I was talking to a friend of mine who was actually in the process of doing this. And he said that he had to teach himself never to be too big to serve in the smallest of ways. He started out in church ministry taking out the church's trash every Sunday afternoon. And then when they saw he was of good character and could be trusted with a little bit more responsibility, he started serving in the children's ministry. He then got the courage to evangelize to his co-workers. He started irregularly giving sermons whenever the pastor was out sick or they needed someone. He got married, has two kids, and is teaching his children to seek first the kingdom. All because he had this sense of desperation to say, I want to seek you first, God. And I'm going to do that in any way that I can. This is how we Christians build the kingdom of God. It is through his righteousness that we seek and grab onto and start laying up the foundation for the kingdom. And we're not building a physical kingdom, but we are spreading the truth of the gospel building up, soul by soul, the body of believers. All together, we must grab hold of Christ, cling tightly to him, share the message of salvation, and build up the body of believers, strengthening and supporting one another in faith. And we do all of this because he did it for us first. He came down from his glorious throne in heaven, the perfect place like no other, to join us in our broken, depressed, tainted, mess of a world as a child to then be captured and crucified we didn't deserve it but he paid the price for our sins because he loves us and then he defeated death and rose three days later and that is why we serve the Lord we honor him and we love others as we love ourselves we seek righteousness so that we can be more like him now I skipped over verse 27 a little while back when we were talking about worrying But I wanted to look at it here, especially because it offers up an interesting point. Verse 27 says, which of you by worrying can add one hour to his life? Immediately when you read that, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And then you continue reading. But isn't that an odd point? It isn't the first or last rhetorical question that Jesus asks here. I'm pretty sure it's the third. But it's almost like a rhetorical challenge. It's like Jesus is saying, I want to see anyone make something good come out of worrying about anything. Charles Spurgeon addresses this. He says, if there's no rain on the farm, will the fretfulness of the farmer compel the rain clouds to to come? 
If it's raining too much, will grumbling or complaining make them depart? If your business gets no profit, what profit will complaining about it bring? This worrying is a poor business. It cannot bring any good results. All the worry, all the complaining when things don't go our way, all of it is futile. There is simply nothing to gain by worrying and complaining if we are in Christ. That is what I would urge all of us to do as a church, as a holy people, is to seek God's first in all things. Because what I'm discovering is that the more that we do that, the more full our lives will be. The more that we let God's love pour into our lives, the more that we can pour God's love into others. Going over this verse again. Seek first. Set Christ as our first priority in life. The kingdom of God, wherever God reigns as king, and his righteousness, modeling after Jesus, being with him, like him, and doing what he did, and all these things, necessities, anything that we could possibly worry about will be added to you. Let us pray, church. Heavenly Father, we look to you You're above all things. Your way is higher than ours. And anything that we can do, you can do better. We submit ourselves to you so that you might work in us and through us, that we may be salt and light to the world. And Lord, this this world, it hasn't submitted to you yet. But Lord, let us be a people, let us be a church that has. Let this be a place on earth where people can come to and say, this is a place that God is working in. I can see God in here. Because we devote ourselves to you, your gospel, your good news. We are laying up brick by brick the foundation for the eternal kingdom. And even when it gets tough, even when we worry, and even when we're lower. God, you are faithful. You came and you died, and you rose again. And so we want to seek you first, and your righteousness. We want to be with you. We want to become like you. And we want to do what you do. So Lord, give us that ability work in our lives work in this church and we will be a holy people in your name we pray amen every week here at Lake Springs Church we take communion and communion goes Jesus took the bread he split it gave it to his disciples and he said this is my body which is broken for you and then he took the cup and he said this is my blood which is poured out for you take this and do this in remembrance of me there are communion stations here, there there, there when you feel ready Let's go and take it.